Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Perpetual Chess. I am here with American slash Ukrainian talented young grandmaster, Yaro Zherobok. Yaro, thanks for joining us. Yeah, sure. It's a pleasure. So you're coming to us live from New York. You might be the busiest man in chess right now. You've got the Collegiate Final Four coming up this weekend, the Pro Chess League Final after that, and then no, none other than the U.S. Chess Championships following that. So why are you doing an interview when you have so much stuff coming up, Yaro? Yeah, uh, it's just fun to do an interview, I guess, and uh, I'm always wondering what people will ask me, so, you know, I'm kind of like curious, George, you know, <laughs> just one of them. <laughs> nice, gotcha. Well, yeah, well, we have so much to talk about, both about your career and what's going on in the chess world with the candidates just having been completed, um, but let's start with your your... You've got so many events coming up, but one that we have not talked about much on the podcast is the Collegiate Final Four. Uh, we've had... You know, many players who came through some of the chess powerhouses like Webster and uh, all of the University of Texas chess powerhouses. So now what's happening for you? What brings you to New York? Who do you guys play? Uh, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm uh, playing for uh, St. Louis University. I almost wanted to say St. Louis Arch- Archbishops. Right, yeah. who you I also mean, play for. <laughs> yeah, so I'm playing for St. Louis University this weekend and... Um, well, last year I also played for St. Louis. I mean St. Louis University because I'm doing a graduate program there, and finally graduating this August. And uh, I think this year um, my team has uh, the greatest chances uh, to succeed. Uh, it's not my first uh, Final Four. In fact, it's my fifth. So I played like four years before. Um, uh, I played three years for Texas Tech University. And I have to say that uh, my team has never come so close in uh, rating to match Webster's players. Because, uh, well, Webster used to have Wesley So on the team. They used to have uh, um, Vietnamese Le Quan on, on, on the team, like all the super GMs. Now now they kind of have weakened uh, uh, lineup. And also we have a lot stronger lineup is this this year I'm playing on board three being 26 to 40 P day on April 1st I, I believe um, so yeah we have a really strong team Webster got a little bit weaker team so I think this year is going to be the closest uh, um, championship yeah so you I'm guys I couldn't believe how strong all four teams were looking at it just shaking my head I mean you guys all have like 2600s basically growing on trees so it's incredible, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. So what's the format? Is it uh, head-to-head matches? Like you play a team in, um, l- like the Final Four in basketball, where you play a team in the other on the other side, there's another matchup, and the winner plays the winner? Uh, no, the, the, the format is not the ideal, in my uh, opinion, because, um, yeah, we're, playing, we're just playing two, I mean, three other teams. And everybody is playing three other teams, and uh, the individual points uh, count the most. So, so theoretically, you can lose one match zero four, and then win two matches four zero, and still get the first place. Okay. So, I mean, you well, or you can perform better than the team who wins. Uh, uh, I mean, that wins uh, three matches two and a half to one and a half. So that like. You know, so it's a bit weird to me. But, okay, we have what we have. So. Okay, and you're going to play the other third boards? Uh, yeah, I'm going to play the other third boards. Yeah, that's right. So do you know who you play? Which individuals? Uh, I have no idea. Oh, know. wow. Good good for you. I mean, for one thing, these teams are so strong that it must be hard to know exactly who people are bringing. And also, I'm sure you've got so much on your plate between the Pro Chess League and the U.S. Championship that, you know, yeah. you just, just got to well, take them as they come. Yeah, the pairings will be uh, ready uh, tonight, I believe. So, but even when I know my pairings, I'll probably prepare just a, a little bit, like maybe maximum an hour, you know, just to save the energy for the games. Yeah, I think that's a good approach. And are you a fixed repertoire guy, or do you play like lots of openings? 
Uh, well, I more like fixed repertoire guy. Uh, like I prepare some openings and then I just play them for a while, and then my I may prepare something else and then I play that for a while, you know, until the the effect is just kind of runs out. You know? Okay, and uh, so do you have how many games tomorrow? Like, is it three games in a day? No, it's uh, three days. Would I mean three games in one day would have been quite a stretch. Yeah, the classical time control. So you're playing two games tomorrow and then one game on Sunday, and the games start like super early. Well, at least for me, right? Like, uh, Nine a.m. I guess is the last game. So yeah, so many chess players are night owls. So I, I appreciate you joining me this morning, ten thirty. At least you're you're in the the ballpark of the right schedule. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> So yeah, you, I mean, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's why I like the uh, championship games are at least at one p.m. So yeah, that's kind of the perfect time, I think. Because um, if you have too much time, you can start to flag. You know, like around four or five p.m. I, I at least often get that sort of late day lull. So, um, but if you're playing chess, you're wired, so you can kind of avoid it. Um, if you're yeah. playing a tournament game. Anyway, so we have so much to talk about, but I feel like where we have to go next is the candidates. You actually played and defeated Fabiano Caruana, our newly crowned candidate last year in the U.S. Championship in a pretty cool game. Uh, and you, you know, you're strong enough where you have a sort of, I would say, informed perspective on what we can expect in this championship. So how do you handicap the Carlson Caruana matchup that we now know will be happening in November? Um, I think that it's going to be a very close match, a very close match, and I think uh, Carlson will have to work a lot of on the openings kind of to match uh, Karana's preparation because, uh, yeah, I feel like in that respect, Karana is uh, quite a bit ahead of uh, Carlson. Well, I mean, I'm not saying that Carlson has bad openings. Of course, he has great repertoire, but... You know, I mean, it's all on a relative level, and I think uh, Corona has just fantastic preparation. So, if uh, Carlson manages uh, to escape all these opening traps and all the opening preparation that Corona will surely have, then, um, well, he will be the favorite, but otherwise, I think this is going to be like 50 50, pretty much a coin toss match. Wow, okay. Because I feel like just based on the ELOs and based on their lifetime record and stuff like that and things I've seen people say online, I feel like some people are saying Caruana has a 30% chance and I've seen people go up to 45. And of course, there's the people who like to have hot takes who just say Carlson's going to win, which to me, of course, he given his track record, I think he has to be the favorite. But they're so close. It's crazy not to say that they have a chance. But anyway, 50-50, you're giving Caruana quite a good chance. Um, yeah, I think it's a fair coin to us, really, because, uh, um, you know, rating-wise, they're very close. I mean, once you on the 28th level, it kind of <laughs> says something about your strength, right? Plus, uh, I really think that uh, Carlson may face uh, problems with black color. Yeah, I was thinking when you were talking about openings that black in particular has to be an issue. Like, well, if he man if he manages to somehow get out of uh, trouble in the opening, then well, um, he'll be slight favorite. But if not, then well, that's why I'm giving fifty fifty. Yeah, and it only takes one or two games. It's not like you have to get a crushing blow every game. But if you can trip him up in one or two lines and convert that into a win, then you go from what's essentially an even match to having a half a point or so in hand. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. And um, um, Carlson, Car- Carlson had quite a bit of uh, problems um, with Karyakin, and uh, I think Karyakin is just, uh, well, in general, not not as good as Corona, you know. I mean, he's good, of course, but Corona is stronger, so... We'll see. I mean, barely, barely survived against uh, Karakin last. Year. I mean, not last year in 2016. I mean, yeah, so, yeah, barely, yeah, barely survived. So, and it, when Karakin was defending, 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 and Carlson had huge problems with, uh, uh, you know, converting the advantages that he got in uh, numerous games. And Karana, Karana once said that he defends pretty well. I remember there was like an interview. In, at Gibraltar, 
and he's like, "Well, I guess I defend pretty well, you know." Right. Race, like, what do you do the best in chess, you know? And he's like, "Well, I guess I defend pretty well." <laughs> I'm like, "All right, this is pretty modest." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got such a well-rounded yeah. style that even as a, a teacher, I mean, I teach mostly uh, beginnerish level kids, but like looking for like you know beautiful games that I can show from Caruana, it's not as easy to find as some of the other elite players. Cause he... Well, yeah, he's he's solid, and uh, I think his style is like... He's like improved Karakin in a way, I think. I mean, he's also defense very well, very solid, but his opening prep was probably just a lot better. Yeah. So his, skills, his skill set is a bit wider, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so stay tuned. It should be interesting. And, of course, there's already rumors floating. It's been scheduled to take place in London. But depending on where you read about the World Championship, they may or may not have a venue secured, depending on who you read. And and now Rex Sinkfeld and the St. Louis Chess Club are uh, making... They put out a statement that basically said they'd be willing to consider hosting this. So do you have any... Being a St. Louis resident and pretty... Uh, tied into that crowd do you have any information about this or any opinion about what it would be like to have this tournament move from london to st louis i mean this match well uh, no in fact that's the first time i hear this um uh, but i mean i suspected that something like this uh may go may be going on uh but I that's the first time I hear something like that. Okay, so. yeah, Yasser Sarawan dropped the rumor immediately when it looked like Caruana was gonna uh, just when he was finishing off his game against Grishuk, and sure enough, they put out that statement yesterday. So, uh, I mean, I I love London and the U.S., but being being that I'm an American citizen and you know in the chess business here, of course, I would love to see it happen, and I would you know want to try to make it out there, and I'm sure you could drop in, being that you live in St. Louis. Yeah, of course. I would love to see that uh, here in America much better than in London. Because, well, have no connection to London whatsoever. So. Yeah, and yeah, shout, I mean, shout out to all our British listeners. We love you too, but you know, <laughs> yes, it, it, it can only be in one place. So <laughs> we, we got a roof for the United States in this case. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, you're such a busy chess pro. I feel like you're at least in this little cycle. You're living the life almost of a, a true professional athlete. You're you're globe trotting. You're you're in New York for this match, and then you're headed to San Francisco for the Pro Chess League. So, tell us what you know about what the Pro Chess League final has in store. Uh, I mean, I know sometimes the players don't get too concerned with the details, but I'm sure uh, you at least have some idea of like when you're going and probably who you're playing and stuff like that uh yeah well uh the the games uh, will be on april 7th and april 8th uh and uh well the plan was to go there a little bit in advance like on april 5th but uh our tickets uh, we were contacted by the organizers i assume and who like who, i mean who had to book our tickets and for some reason they booked for six, so I guess now we're going on six instead of fifth. But that, but that's okay. Um, and we're gonna play um, the semifinals and then the finals. And uh, the pairings will be random. I'm pretty sure they will announce the pairings uh, like I think a day in, in advance. Um, and there are like three other teams who won their divisions. Um, and, um, I think, I think St. Louis Archbishop's a pretty good favorites to win again. Like last year, we won the, the whole thing. It was just, uh, called a little bit differently and it was a little bit different format. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it was called Pro Chess, well, no, Pro, mm, It was, it was the Pro Chess League last year, but. Uh, it was Pro Chess League and now it's professional. Rapid, well, pretty much the same. Maybe, maybe, maybe the so something was different for sure in the name. I just can't really put my finger around it. Uh, so, Yaro, I'm pretty interested in the format of the Pro Chess League. I think it's awesome that the Chess.com is putting this on, and I think it'll, it's great for chess. But it's interesting to me that you're going to play on the computer. So, how, do you have experience playing competitive games on the computer as opposed to just with a wood chess set or plastic chess set in front of you? 
Uh, no, this 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 whole thing is uh, quite new. Um, but I, I, it's it's really interesting format. I I, I like it. Innovative and uh, well, the stakes are relatively high, um, and a lot of lot of team, a lot of players were engaged uh, in this uh, pro chess leagues. So um, I th- I think this this is just great for chess. Yeah, it should be awesome. And your team is stacked. You've got Caruana at least theoretically on board one, uh, Fedosev board two, super strong twenty seven hundred from Russia. Uh, Akobians, uh, Darius Swartz, yourself. So, do you do you know which guys are going, and is it like public knowledge yet? Uh, who from your team is attending? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a public information yet. Uh, okay, um, so we'll so, keep the names quiet. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, th- I think uh, we have great chances. Well, not not all of the people can go, but uh, we still we still have a very very decent team nice and the other teams just for those who who don't know are Ljubljana Chengdu in China and Armenia so speaks to the truly global reach of chess that uh, these um, it's not just a, a walk across the street for these teams to get there and put on this event it should be um, super interesting and a lot of fun and hopefully hopefully the start of a tradition yeah I, I really hope so I mean uh, we'll have more divisions more teams uh, next year and uh, the word will be will spread out. Yeah, so. and there's there's significant cash on the line too. I mean, I'm sure you've played for some real money in uh, open tournaments and stuff like that. But how much does that factor? And do you think about it much? Uh, not really. I just uh, treat this uh, as a professional. You know, I mean, very seriously, and uh, well, put all of my effort into this and. Uh, just the title. I think more about the title than cash, to be honest, because um, it's like a, it's more prestigious. You know, money comes and goes, but title will stay. Yeah, that that's good perspective. Uh, and speaking of titles, last but not least, in terms of your upcoming events, the U.S. Championship, and I am super psyched for this because, uh, in terms of a national championship, it just has so many strong players. So. Uh, We've got Wesley So, Nakamura, Caruana, yourself, uh, Onishuk, um, Akobian, Awunder Liang from the, the younger set. Uh, so, so many strong players, and you've got a bit of an experience. So, what has your experience so far been like in U.S. championships? Uh, well, last year I played my first one, um, and uh, I was doing pretty well. Uh, after seven games, I was sharing for first place with Wesley So. Uh, but then I just uh, kind of collapsed completely and uh, scored only one out of four in the last games and uh, by losing twice was white by him. So, yeah, it was kind of a disappointing finish, but still like finishing the, in the sixth place, um, kind of in the middle of the pack, which was all right. I think uh, but it told me, you know, Retirement. That well, you'll get sixth place and probably won't complain much. So, but yeah, the, I had that bad aftertaste that I could have achieved a lot more, but just just simply didn't have uh, energy to play the, the the last games. So you felt like that was the issue. You just ran out of gas. Yeah, yeah, I completely ran out of the gas. Yeah, just so. the, especially in the round seven when I. I beat uh, Caruana, and I was just like, <laughs> you know, a bit, a bit too much, you know, to handle. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully that experience makes you stronger. Have you uh, altered your preparation at all from with what you learned from last year? Well, I'm doing a lot of lot more cardio now. <laughs> uh-huh. I had a feeling <laughs> you would say that. Though. Good for you. It's such a like, such a it's... common theme. I mean, I feel like chess players have only figured this out in the past twenty twenty five years that it that it matters so much. But it makes sense. Yeah, just uh, trying to lift weights and then uh, you know, play some racquetball. Um, yeah, that's that's what I like the most. Nice. And, what's... and my preparation for it. Yeah. And what's going on with your chess game? So you're around 150 in the world, FIDE, 10th in the U.S. So that's amazing. Uh 
are you but are you satisfied with that level or are you pushing for more and if so like what are you working on well uh, i i kind of well i was uh, around this uh, level well it was uh, close to top 100 uh at times uh, like i was there around 6 years so nothing very impressive but uh it was just uh, at times i was very focused on my school studies and uh, i was just I'm just always going back and forth between deciding if I should go chess professional full time or if uh, I should look for like so to say normal job, you know. Um, I mean, like some traditional, more traditional career choice, like in the finance industry, let's say, because that's what I'm studying: studying financial economics right now for my grad school. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think I just need to pull the trigger and decide what I really want to do and then uh, just invest 100% of my energy into that thing. Because, like, uh, being distracted all the time is uh, definitely not good for your chess, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. And you're you're 24, is that right? Yeah. We'll be 25 in, uh, in July 14th. So this, you know. Okay. Well, you know, you're definitely not the first, um, you know, bright young chess player to, to face this dilemma. But one good thing about chess is it's always there. You you know, if you want to make a push to be top 30 in the world, I would imagine you, you need to do that relatively soon. But I, for life as a chess professional, as one of the best players in the United States, it's there if you need it, right? Yeah, it is there, but just uh, from playing perspective, and uh, for really, if I want to improve, this is like the last, you know, the last minutes. I I feel like, well, I'm I'm not as the chess players reach their peak around the age of like 31, 32, so probably I have like another solid five to seven years to improve, like to reach my peak. But um, still, the time if the time to work on chess is now, and I mean, if you really want to improve at this level, then you just have to uh, forget about a lot of things. Uh, you know, I mean, just invest yourself in chess completely and uh, avoid a lot of uh, a lot of things like uh, you know, alcohol, tobacco. You know, just. Uh, living a healthy lifestyle as well and then probably it's possible but otherwise it's not so a lot Man. of a lot of uh, sacrifices uh, yeah be made for sure and you've got a few months left to complete your masters you were saying before we recorded is, is that right yeah i'm uh, finishing uh, my school in august and maybe after that i'll just uh, settle in st louis and uh, devote myself to chess completely yeah, I was going to say that that's sort of a logical time to make a decision. And of course, it, as I was saying, it doesn't have to be permanent. You could just say, OK, uh, like when I had Alex Lenderman on, he was saying um, he felt like even though he's not he, you know, he's in his mid 20s. So not, you know, young, but not a teenager. But he was saying he finally felt like he had some runway to study chess, like without many distractions. So maybe you'll feel the same way. And, you know, if you pour your heart and soul into it for a year or two and it's not working out, you you know, I'm sure you'd have other options. Yeah, well, it's uh, never too late to, to uh, well, I'm not just saying playing, but, you know, then I can just focus on teaching, you know, that's also a career path and playing, like, sort of on the side, you know, that's uh, always a possibility. Yeah, so how much teaching do you do? Uh, I've been doing quite a bit. Uh, I had some crazy weeks where I had like 25 to 30 hours of uh, lessons. Wow, that's intense considering what else you have going on. Yeah, so um, so yeah, quite, quite a bit, but then I had to well, cut down a little bit on teaching and... Uh, uh, you know, cancel a lot of uh, lessons because I just physically cannot accommodate all the requests um, with all these tournaments going on. Mm-hmm. And is it mostly Skype lessons or online lessons? Yeah, they're pretty much exclusively online lessons. Yeah. Okay. And I imagine you have students from everywhere? Yeah, uh, pretty, pretty much. Uh, 
I have students from Europe and uh, um, even from Africa. Wow. So, um, yeah, from America, obviously. Um, yeah, pretty much from everywhere. Yeah. And we've had several uh, natives of Ukraine as guests. Um, they've got quite quite a history in chess. But why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? I mean, I know you were super strong like from a young age, you played in uh, the world use and stuff like that. But how'd you get into chess and where'd you grow up and all that stuff? Yeah, I uh, grew up in Lviv, Ukraine. It's a, I would say, chess capital of uh, Ukraine. Cause, uh, a lot of uh, grandmasters uh, live there. The most famous one being uh, Ivanchuk. The legend. Yeah, the legend who's... Uh, who came super close to becoming world champion himself, and but but he lost to Pon- Ponomaryov, um, not a Ukrainian. Yeah. So, um, uh, and uh, I started playing chess uh, when I was seven. You know, at first it was just a, I would say, sort of hobby, nothing uh, special, just just a game. And then uh, at the age nine, I started beating pretty much everybody at the club. Uh, I mean, for my level, I would say. And then uh, my interest really took off, and uh, I started spending a lot more time on chess um, since since I was nine, I would say. Yeah. And did you have a trainer, or how did you, like how did you get better? Uh, well, I was uh, reading a lot of books, uh, which probably was unusual for the. Uh, young age, but I just didn't have any laptops. I didn't even have a personal computer, you know. So what else would you do, right, in such uh, conditions? Yeah. So um, I just had a chess set, and I had a, a lot of uh, chess books that some people recommended, and uh, I was just studying them back and forth, you know, pretty much. I would say I remember I had a book of uh, 100 selected games of Karpov. I mean, what a great choice for a kid, you know. I'm not yeah. even sure how, how that book came to me, you know. So I was studying games of carp, and I was just trying to guess the moves. And then if, I was covering the text moves. And then um, if my move was different from carpus, and it was the case quite a bit, then I would just try to read through comments and understand what's different. Why my move is different? Why I'm not playing at Carp? Why I'm not as good as Carpo yet? You know? Right. <laughs> and uh, and then that's how I uh, I got better, I think. But wow. it's a it's a but while I was a kid, I was playing uh, in pretty wild manner. I would say. I mean, I I tried to build some uh, solid game, and then when I felt that uh, the time is right, then I would sacrifice a lot of stuff. But very often, I my timing wasn't very good, so I would just end up sacrificing a lot of stuff, no matter what. That's funny. That's a pretty big dichotomy to have these like uh, attacking player instincts, but to be studying Karpov from a young age. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, very unusual. I would say it's, I'm still surprised of my choices back then. I mean, Karpov, and I remember I had some positional books by Tarash. Um. Which is also pretty weird. Like, why, why Tarish? Right. Anyway, so Tarish, Karpov, and then I had uh, Batwinik, uh, Batwinik books um, that I studied quite a bit. Uh, like the he had like three volumes uh, of his games annotated by himself, so it was quite invaluable source as well. So, do you um, have a, a favorite chess player? Historically, uh, I don't think so. I just really hard for me to say who's my favorite player. I like them. I like a lot of players. So they they just different, you know. In a way, it's like comparing oranges to apples, right? So to speak, because yeah. the styles uh, were just so different. So, and for listeners who are always interested in getting better at chess, it's it's notable to me that you were mostly studying games collections. Uh, I mean, some of that gets lost because a lot of uh, a lot of people looking to improve, um, you know, they break the game into segments. So they're like, do I work on my opening, my middle game or my end game? But when you study whole games of amazing players, you're working on all of them at once. 
Yeah, I uh, I think uh, really bring I mean breaking the game into three parts and studying everything separately makes sense uh, for like more advanced players. It's like uh, you know for some bodybuilders working on their biceps or triceps, you know, just isolating some groups of muscles, you know, so they like get more definition, so they like more visible or something. Right. You know, the same the same works like for the advanced chess players, you know. But first you need to build that sort of base, you know, when you understand the game. And then you can break the game into the segments and start learning them separately. That's that's my philosophy. Okay. And if you you know, we talked before about you, maybe you trying to make a push and get even stronger uh once you're done with school, what what would be your focus of your own study? Well, um, well. First of all, uh, first of all, I'll need to improve uh, my white openings because, you, well, I'm at this stage when uh, I have to improve like every stage separately. I would say um, so. White openings for sure will be there. Also, technique. Like uh, I don't convert a lot of positions that I probably should have converted. Um. Then um, defense, so, so some some skills like uh, defending like uh, worse positions uh, against uh, the engine. That would be my next step for sure. So, do you do a lot of practice with the engine? Uh, well, n- now yeah, I'm getting into that. So let's say I would give myself some certain positions, and then I would play them against the engine, and then I'll see how I do, and then I'll check myself, uh, you know, I'll analyze what did they do wrong, what they did right. So just uh, playing different types of positions against the engine and uh, playing them many, many times until it becomes a routine and uh, some ideas are really become, I mean, really become obvious. And, uh, you know, because chess, chess in a way is all pretty technical, like at this level. So you just need to learn how to do some certain things. Okay. Yeah. And like, s- sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Like the interesting thing. Like let's say your position is slightly worse. Let's say the computer says it's a negative point five. Let's say so you like worse half a pawn, right? So and then I give myself that position to play against the engine, and then I'll see how many moves can I hold on there, right? And I'll do, like, let's say 10 positions like this where the evaluation is uh, negative 0.5, right? So I'll be on the defending side, and then I'll see if uh, I'll improve my defense skills. You know, it's kind of kind of advanced stuff. That's, uh, that's really interesting. I, I know that uh, Hikaru, when I had him on the podcast, I couldn't get him to talk about it, but Legend has it that he's done a lot of work with engines in terms of how he's gotten so strong. But we haven't... We have mixed... I mean, obviously, computers are a great resource in the chess world, but some people think that, especially for people not as strong as yourself, they can be a detriment if you pay too much attention to them. But the actual sort of deliberate practice of trying certain positions, I think, is um, has to be good for your chess. And do you do that with the winning side as well? You mentioned you want to work on converting some positions. Do you have certain positions in mind that you would practice? Uh, yeah, yeah. Of course, and they're a lot easier to select as well. Just uh, let's say, let's say uh, I may look at some games, classical games, and uh, I may try to guess the right move, and uh, then check myself. Uh, let's say with the engine. Also, if I have a the book available, I'll also read the book. You know, to see what the pe- what people at the time were thinking. You know, just so I have like two references to compare myself to. Gotcha. And then, uh, let's say if the position is completely winning after that move, then I'll just go straight to uh, the playing software and I'll just uh, play that position and I'll see if I can convert. You know, and then and that way you also learn the difference between, let's say, plus one point five or plus two. What does plus three means? You know, I mean, you don't really know what it means until you try it and practice. You try to play in that position and all, all these positions and then you see the difference you know because uh, I was doing this with my uh, one one of my students you were doing one position the computer said well this is minus 2.89 I still remember that <laughs> pretty vividly and 
and we were, but the position was pretty wild, so we like, somehow we managed to lose that position against the engine, well, 3400, but the position was wild, all right, so somehow we missed some tactics, and computer defended, and we lost, so, and then we started playing the position, which was like only minus 0.9, and we were black, uh, and we were pushing, 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 and then somehow computer defended anyway. But we were never, we were never at risk of losing that game. Uh, but position was a lot quieter, you know, not as wild for sure, just a technical one. All right, with no attack for our king. And I'm like, all right, now you see what's what can be the difference between point nine and uh, almost two point nine. Right. So, so yeah, I mean, you should understand how it works, and then once you grasp how the computer evaluates then uh, and you understand why then you will definitely become a better player but this uh, this is this stuff is uh pretty advanced i must say uh for the for the last advanced players who could just begin or who can be even title players but don't have too many years of experience i would just suggest uh, going through the games first building that base and then you know working on Definition, sort of, you know, yeah, defining their chest strength, chest muscle. Yeah, although it's advanced in the context that you do it, and maybe that some of your stronger students do it. But there's, you know, there's ways that even lower level players can still take the same idea, whether it be the, you know, practicing the Lucina position against the computer, or just making sure you can win with, you know, uh, an extra pawn in various endings, stuff like that, where it, you know, it would be trivial for you, but still, um, it could be a neglected part of someone else's game. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Even if somebody wants to learn how to mate with, let's say, knight and bishop versus king, right? then, yeah, you can do that against the computer, and just, so make sure you don't embarrass yourself. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> um, so what else do you do with your students? Uh, we do a lot of things. Uh, um, we can analyze openings if they have many, spe- I mean, special requests, or we can, um, well, let's say, let's say I find some games and I don't really know. I mean, I know they're classical games, but I don't know what what is going on really. So we set the position, let's say, and move twenty, and I say, okay, so let's say we have three minutes here. All right, so in three minutes, we have to come up with the moves, and then we should give our evaluation of the events and maybe approximate calculation, all right? So so then I set timer for three minutes, and then in three minutes, so first my student goes then uh, and tells tells the move and the evaluation, then I go, give the move and the evaluation, and then we compare ourselves uh, who who, because sometimes actually my students can give a better move and evaluation than I do. So that's pretty sad. And that's, <laughs> and that's uh, like sti- motivating and stimulating them, you know, to to do better. So I like this uh, approach when we actually training together and then it's more fun for students as well, um, you know, to, to compare themselves to, to the grandmaster. Nice. Well, maybe it's just because you're such a good teacher, you know, that – your students come up with better moves than you because you taught them so well. <laughs> well, uh, oh, sometimes I'm just not in shape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it might be just that you're spreading yourself too thin if you're doing 25 to 30 lessons a week on top of uh, your coursework, on top of your playing. So, Well, th- those those were pretty crazy weeks, I have to admit. The usual week is uh, maybe like 15 to 20 max. Okay. So, so and when, yeah. And when you manage to do things away from chess, what uh, you mentioned um, racquetball, what else are you into? Like music or sports or what else do you do? Uh, I don't get much time to anything else. I just my usual routine would be to wake up, uh, uh, to wake up, and I mean anytime I can wake up anytime. In fact, sometimes I wake up at six, sometimes a.m., sometimes at ten. So I have to set up my schedule probably. But anyway, then I go to to the gym. I work out for like two hours, and then uh, and then that's how I start my day, you know. And then uh, I pretty much uh, get some food and either prepare myself for the for all the tournaments or just uh, 
start teaching and the whole day is gone. So yeah, I I hear you. Time can fly by. Yeah, just uh, especially if there are some demanding projects at school, then it's just uh, there is no time for anything else. So I feel like there is barely time to go and work out every day. You know. Well, every day is a lot. Well, yeah, but then uh, kind of keeps. Me, I mean, it makes me happy to work out. You know, you have blood flowing right. all over your body. You know, so yeah. And you mentioned it's important for your chest too. So yeah, it's very important to have a uh, stamina. You know, because uh, sometimes you just uh, run out of energy. And a lot of people play well when they have energy. You know, when you don't have energy, then it's just so difficult to play this game. That's, well, I mean, I figured that because I'm like, how come when I was, uh, let's say, 19, my rating actually was, okay, I was 18, and my rating was about the same as it is now. And I'm like, how come? I understood chess a lot worse than now. And, uh, like, I have a lot less skills than now, but my rating was about the same. I'm like, how is that possible? Then I was thinking about it, and I realized that it must be because of energy, you know? Because back then I just had plenty of energy, and also, and I was playing mostly in Europe. Uh, so when I was eighteen, when I was nineteen, then I pretty much stopped playing in Europe because I moved to the United States. Yeah. So and I played in Europe, and usually the tournaments had just one game a day, you know. So you could have just prepared for the game for like three hours or so, and then you could have taken a nap for like two hours. You know, and then you just you could have invested yourself completely in just one game. So, so that's the difference. And uh, in America, a lot, a lot of uh, I played a lot of opens, a lot of open um, open tournaments uh, uh, where there are two games a day. So we kind of have to manage your energy really well. You know, maybe sometimes it makes sense even to make a quick draw, but then. The question is against whom? <laughs> because every time I make a draw here, I lose rating. So right, yeah, that that's that's kind of like a first world problem. You're you're so good at chess that uh that yeah, you got to pick your spots carefully. Yeah, so I mean, maybe I probably sh- I shouldn't have played so many open tournaments. That's uh, that's what I know now. But well, that that wisdom came to me a bit too yeah, too, the, you know, too late. Cost you some rating points to find that out. It cost me a lot of rating points because I was gaining rating points. Uh, you know, once I moved to St. Louis, started playing this uh, close to close to tournaments, invitational tournaments, like with twenty six hundred plus feet average. You know, then I started gaining rating. I'm like, hmm. So I played like past two tournaments, uh, nine games, so like eighteen games total, and I lost zero, and my position was twenty six hundred plus players. You know. And I'm like, hmm. And then I go to the open tournaments, and then I start losing the games. There's some inconsistencies here, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah, well, it's kind of a separate skill set, uh, navigating those open fields, it seems like. Yeah, you have uh, to risk uh, a lot. I mean, sometimes uh, the opening choices can be quite questionable. So you have to put yourself at disadvantage at first. So, like, people, let's say you're playing somebody who's black, and and that person wants to make a draw against you, and then they start trading pieces, you know, they playing something extra solid, so then you have to play some weird openings like Perk, you know? Something. Right. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying Perk is bad, I mean, it's alright, probably, if you work really, really hard on it. <laughs> Seems like only Magnus can get away with playing it. <laughs> I mean, well... I think I actually believe that you can play any opening as long as uh, you put a work into it, and uh, pretty much everything is playable except something completely ridiculous, obviously. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's not the kind of chess that you want to play. You know, you playing some anti chess, I would say. You know, to win the games, and that's not good. Sometimes it goes the other way. Right. So, Yara, I've only got a few more topics to hit for you. One one of them is I, just, I wanted to circle back a little to the U.S. championship. So we mentioned that you beat Fabiano. Obviously, that means that you also got to play Hikaru and Wesley So. But I was curious, like, who? Are, what are the other strongest players you played? And, like, what are the most memorable experiences you've had in, in your chess career? 
Uh, well, just before uh, moving to to the U.S., I was playing for the German uh, team in the German team championship, and uh, I beat uh, Geary, and I beat Navarra back then. So, wow. so they were already in like twenty seven forty plus range. So <laughs> then I had to, like my doubts should i should i actually go steady you know huh, right uh well, maybe should i stick with chess but well the decision was made before then so i'm like okay also i uh played uh, i beat momentiaro at the world cup in 2011 right yeah so i in a match of four games so it's not like just one game that can be pretty random you know so in the match of four games and uh, at the time he was uh well, he was definitely in top 10 back then. Well, now he's, like, what, number two, I think. Yeah. So, I have... So, you know, when I was looking at the candidates, I'm like, okay, Caruana's in the first place, Mamadiaro is up there. So, I'm like, if either of them, you know, qualifies, I can say, oh, I have a plus score against the, the world championship contender, you know. Yeah, that gives you a reason to root for Fabiano in the in the uh, world championship match. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So what does it feel like to beat a guy like that? Do you get extra nervous towards the end of the game? Uh, or, you know, does it feel like business as usual? Uh, it definitely doesn't feel like usual. I was just, uh, what I've noticed something was different is that I was uh, as focused against uh, Corona as uh, I was at the World Cup in 2011, you know. So I wish I can be as focused all the time, but I don't know, maybe I just had some extra motivation, you know. Well, hopefully you can recreate it. So uh, speaking of the World Cup, I have to ask you what happened this year with, uh, with you're not showing up. Yeah, I uh, couldn't go. There was just some green card issues. So I just didn't want to risk my residency, you know. So, that makes sense. Uh, how come you didn't let them know, like, beforehand? Uh, that was, uh, it was not settled. I mean, uh, well, because uh, my lawyers told me I should get it by then. Okay. But the time was running out, and I was still not getting it. That's and, a bummer. And, yeah, and then, but then, uh, after all, uh, even, even then, uh, they did not have any candidate from the United States, I mean, legitimate candidate, they would have put some somebody else, so I don't feel bad, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, it's still good not to have forfeits, but... Yeah, but... And, I, and I mean, uh, so many of our listeners, I'm sure, like, first of all, that tournament is awesome. I mean, you know, organization issues, FIDE issues, notwithstanding, like, just the format is so much fun, and it's, you know, it's so much fun to sweat that you know the, any any missing board was uh disappointing and especially of course as as an american someone representing the united states so hopefully you can make it in the future yeah for sure uh, i will make it in the future unless something super extraordinary happens but um, otherwise yeah should be no issues do you think something like that like does it adversely affect your standing like not showing up or are you you know you'll be fine going forward well i don't think so i don't why it should adversely affect me i mean uh this is a pretty personal issue so right so it's not, it's not like uh, i decided last minute on a whim you know oh, i'm just not gonna go i don't feel like it you know right yeah gotcha it's, in a way it's a personal tragedy i would say you know? yeah no it's an amazing opportunity especially considering as you mentioned the showings you've had in the past um uh, and I don't know what's your rapid game like. Like, how do you compare in classical to faster time controls? I, I think my rapid is uh, quite a bit stronger, in fact, because like I can concentrate a lot better for shorter periods, and it's uh, rapid time control. It just allows you still to show some a lot of skill. You know, I mean, in blitz, it's uh, pretty volatile. You know, blitz is hap- everything is happening a bit too fast, and blitz is my weakest side for sure but rapid something in the middle is actually is actually the strongest i mean even if you look at my performance in this year in the pro chess league i was uh before the the last match that i played that was in 27 uh 26 performance and then last <laughs> i don't know what happened in the last match but i scored only 50 percent two out of four 
and I dropped a bit below 2700 but still that was up there so yeah that's not not too bad <laughs> yeah not too bad I think yeah Cool. Well, so you mentioned uh, the immigration issues and your lawyers advising you to stay in the United States. So, do you are you planning on staying after you graduate? No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Um, I'll just uh, settle in St. Louis. Mostly. You like? So you like it there? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, fun. Um, I mean, the chess club is there. It's. Uh, uh, I like uh, the, the kind of district that surrounds uh, the chess club. It's a uh, Pretty, pretty European like, I would say. Nice, sounds good to me. I still, I still have to make it out there um, one of these days. Um, so, last thing, just a little bit more about the U.S. Championship because I mean, I'm excited for the Pro Chess League. I, I'm curious to see what happens in the Final Four, but that's the one that I that's really circled on my calendar. So, uh, the there's the top three, and then there's the up and comers, um, as well as some stalwarts in the field do you do you feel like there's a favorite in this u.s the men's u.s championship well uh, the three guys uh, i mean well wesley Ferran, and nakamura obviously um but i did well for maybe top three places but after that pretty much anything can happen uh, the field, the field is besides besides these three guys. Uh, I mean, I feel like the field is really even. Uh, everybody can beat everybody. Well, and even the the three guys, they also top three guys. They can, uh, you know, just make mistakes. They can lose, and they can just be not in shape. You know, after all, right? Yeah, and if they're not in shape. They become mortals, just like we are. So. Right. I mean, yeah, and you were. You just needed a few more good rounds last year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just I'm probably needed to determine to stop after seven rounds. I'm like, okay, guys. Right. Yeah. Stop. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Um, everybody's <laughs> happy with their position. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Cool. Well, we wish you luck. I mean, you've got so much stuff coming up. So I want to thank you for for taking the time. Uh, I'm sure you're super busy and good luck in all this all these exciting events. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, yeah, our last question, if anyone wants to reach you, I saw that. Oh, actually, I had two more questions because I had a question from a supporter of the podcast, uh, a guy named Mike Klein, uh, who you probably know. So Mike said, why is why is your chess.com username Cruel Yarrow? Uh, well, I'm not quite sure why. I mean, <laughs> I created it in 2013, so... Cruel Yarrow. I don't know. I, I just thought it sounds funny. So. <laughs> it does sound funny. I think that's what piqued his interest. Yeah. But no no uh, story of cruelty behind it? Uh, no. I was just... I, I think I was uh, beating somebody, like, uh, over the board, and they're just like, oh, you're so cruel. You know, when I was at Texas Tech, and I was beating somebody, like, you know, who didn't know that I was a grandmaster. <laughs> right. And I just went to chess.com and made myself Cruel Yarrow. Oh, nice. That's <laughs> funny. Like, yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, anyway, I was going to say people can reach you on chess.com. I saw that your your profile there is pretty fleshed out. Is there any other way that uh, people should reach out to you if they want to? Uh, well, chess.com says it all. It has my number, has my, my email. Uh, I don't know if there are any other means of communication. That's, that's good enough. Yes. Okay, cool. Well, well, thanks again for your time and good luck with everything. We'll be uh, watching and rooting, and uh, you know, hopefully, as a as a chess fan, I I have to say, I hope you uh, you find some time to to make one more push and at least try to get in the top one hundred and and see what you can do uh, when you're finished with school. Mm, yep, that that would be great. Yep, thank you. Special thanks goes out to my Patreon and PayPal perpetual partners. Without the generous support of the chess community, Perpetual Chess would not exist in its current form. I would like to thank Adam Vrankulj, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Chris Wainscott, Chad Hilton, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Chris Flanagan, Daniel Naylor, Daniel Schaefer, Gary Andrews, Greg Shahadi, James Bonastia, Jason Dunbar, Jennifer Valens, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, Jen Shahadi, Jen Scream, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, Johnny McMenamin, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopalakrishnan, Lorraine Dore, Matthew Passi, Macaulay Peterson, Matthew Tedesco, Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randall Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Rob Lazorchek, Robert Steiner, 
Tatia Vabrahamian, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotella, Victor Vrankul, Zhao Cheng, and last but not least, Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, everyone. I'll catch you all next week.